I'll be right there. I'll be right there. Just give me a minute. Holy cow. Just give me a second. I'll, I'll be right there. I'm sorry I'm late. I'll be there. Hold on. Holy smokes, that crosswind. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And those skydivers over the land. Oh, unbelievable tonight, the skydivers at the land. I nearly missed one. Good evening, folks. Welcome to the uh, first ever EAA Chapter 288 virtual gathering brought to you by COVID-19. That's right. Buy one, get one free. COVID-19. Find it on sale at Publix, Walmart, and Home Depot. So, I need to take this off because I'm going to get really hot with this helmet on. But thank you to uh, Matt and Dave for setting me up with this. We're going to have a lot of fun tonight, I hope. Let's see if my face ID works. No, it doesn't work because I have something on my phone I want to share. Okay, here we go. Whew, that was warm. That was warm. So tonight during the briefing, if you want to... Uh, text in a question, comment, um, whatever you'd like. Matt's phone number is on the screen. I'll be putting it up again uh, on several occasions. So when you, uh, when you do text in, make sure you, you tell us who you are. So Matt will uh, get the message on his phone. He'll relay it to me, and we'll try to answer any questions that you have. And right away, thanks to Matt Simmons for his idea for a virtual gathering and his techie support. I... Uh, I'm not used to this on-camera stuff, so uh, I wanted you to see what I'm looking at and what Matt and Dave have set up for us here. Whoops, went too far. So there's my technical support team. Matt's sitting there very calm, cool, calm, collected, making all this happen. Dave's role tonight is to make sure I look at the camera, because I'm not used to looking at the camera. Thank you, Dave. I'll look at the camera. So anyway, we'll press on. So uh, today is April 16th, 2020, as you all know. If you're at least 10 years old on April 16th in 1970, please stand up. I'm just kidding. I can't see you. Sit down. But what do you remember about April 16th, 1970? What was going on 50 years ago today? And ironically, it was something that gathered the entire world together. It was an event that everyone in the world was concerned with. Kind of like what's going on right now. I'll give you a hint. Who said this? Houston, we've had a problem. Obviously, I'm referring to Apollo 13. 50 years ago tomorrow, Apollo 13 splashed down in the Pacific Ocean. Three astronauts returned safely to Earth. And again, the entire world watched as those guys went around the moon, came back to Earth. If you look at the quote and you think it should be, Houston, we have a problem, that's not what was said. That was in the movie. Here's a quick quiz for you. Who did not fly on Apollo 13? The answer is who did not was Ken Mattingly and Tom Hanks. Ken Mattingly was supposed to. I think he came down with a cold or some disease just before. He had measles. He was exposed to measles. I'm told my, he was exposed to measles, so therefore he couldn't fly. However, he was instrumental in bringing him back. His expertise on the ground, he was very instrumental in bringing these guys back to Earth. There they are, Hayes, Swigert, and Lovell. So one more question. Who said failure is not an option? Nobody. That was in the movie also. That was in the movie also. Matt's two for two on this one. This is his field. <laughs> Matt's two for two. So by the way, we're coming to you from inside uh, Dave Baldwin's hangar. There's only three of us here. We're keeping our six foot distance. So uh, all you guys that you, <laughs> yeah. all you guys that usually, <laughs> all you guys that usually sit in the front row and heckle me, Dave and Dave and uh, Matt taking your place. So here's the the agenda for tonight. I'm going to talk some about some of our chapter happenings, some safety items, or what to do while we're waiting to go fly again, and then uh, the virtual tour, which I think everybody was going to enjoy that. Um, Rick Weiss has done a great job on our website. I'll call your attention to it. Keep, he keeps adding stuff almost on a daily basis. 
So the website is really doing, really looking good, eaa288.org. Matt, my quicker field. Quicker field. Okay, here we go. So I thought we'd have a festival tonight, the social distancing festival. We might as well have fun with this social distancing stuff. I'll just let you look at this one on your own. And of course, the favorite line you never want to say, when did you start looking like your mother? This was March 28th, the last time we actually had a, ga uh, correction, a uh, gaggle brief on a Saturday morning. If you notice, the crowd is thin. A lot of people had already been staying home. And we're keeping our distance. Didn't know it at the time, but that was the last gaggle briefing we've had. Now, you notice there's two people in the golf cart that are not keeping six feet apart, but I guess if you're married, you can get closer than six feet. So Chad and Lori are the only two that are not abiding by the president's orders. Dave's going to fly. Super Dave says he's going to fly. He's prepared. Goggles, a World War II gas mask, gloves, Lysol, hand sanitizer, and a temperature probe. So I guess when he's inverted, he can take his temperature and find out if he's having a rush from flying or he's getting sick. Now Stu, on the other hand, Stu decided to use this valuable ground time to uh, be around his wife, do some nice things with his wife. Gene loves to uh, have him around the house. So Stu decided to learn how to play Mahjong. And as you can see, he's really enjoying the Mahjong. So that's Stu. The calendar. The calendar of events is uh, pretty sad. Lots of to be determines there. Um, VMC, IMC, postpone, next chapter gathering. We may have to do this again. All the youth activities at Oshkosh and the summer camps, those are canceled till next year. Um, the one question about Air Venture, right now it is still on schedule. And I spoke with Charlie Becker just a couple days ago. They expect by the, originally they said the first of May to make a decision. Now they're looking more towards the middle of May to make a decision on Air Venture. And it's, as you can imagine, it's a difficult decision. Charlie pretty much um, represented it as, okay, it's April 16th, I'm gonna get a briefing for a flight I'm gonna do in July. So just how in the world can they predict what's gonna happen in July? So again, oh, also the memorial service for Dennis and Bonnie, which was scheduled for this weekend, that's been delayed, postponed. We don't have a, a new date on that. And of course, Sun and Fun, we already know that that's been delayed. I've been canceled, rather. So again, Matt's phone number's on the screen. If you want to text in any questions, go ahead. We have a couple comments already. I look better with the goggles on. Well, I'm not going to put them back on because I got really hot. Great idea. Well, that was the, the, the whole thing with the goggles and the parachute. No, that was all Dave, Dave Baldwin's idea. So, Great idea for the meeting. Well, I got to give Dave credit. He did that. <laughs> you know, that's not the first time I've heard that. Oh, okay. Well, that wasn't a question. I look, look better with the goggles. I need more makeup. A good start to the meeting. Okay, here we go. I'm going to do a, an airport safety review. We try to do this a couple times a year. It's, it's a safety item that we, we, we keep trying to uh, stress. It's going to be, I'm going to use uh, Spruce Creek as the example, but this really is applicable to our friends and members from Massey. If you fly out of the land, ask yourself, would this be applicable if you had an accident at your airport? The 11 and a half minutes. The last uh, incident that we had, the last incident we had at Spruce Creek, it was 11 and a half minutes from the time 911 was called until the first fire truck arrived. John Ferguson made the call. They kept him on the phone for 11 and a half minutes until the first fire truck arrived. So at Spruce Creek, we have five of these uh, fire boxes located around the airport. The contents of the boxes are like so. Fire extinguishers, 
a real mean looking tool to break a canopy, a bag of miscellaneous tools, in that bag of tools, the sharp knives to cut seat belts, whatever we may need to do. So the last accident that we had near the approach on runway 24, people responded almost immediately. They took the fire extinguishers. They were able to knock the fire down enough to get the two occupants of the aircraft out. So kudos to everybody who responded. They, by the time the fire trucks arrived, after 11 and a half minutes, both occupants of the airplane were out of the airplane. And the fire was, was knocked down. It was still on fire, but no longer a danger. So <coughs> here's our airport layout. There's where the five fire boxes are. Four on one side of the runway, five on the other. Um, the important thing when you call 911 is the address. There was a slight delay. John Ferguson will tell you the story. He called, we need you at the Spruce Creek Airport, and the question is, where's that? They don't know where the Spruce Creek Airport is. They need to dispatch to an address. So there are four addresses, actually five, on the Spruce Creek Airport they can respond to. Matt, can you circle while I'm doing this? Uh, to Lindy Loop, all the way at the approach end of runway six. That's to Lindy Loop. Go eastbound, that's one Cessna Boulevard. Next one is two Beach Boulevard. And then 98 Lindy Loop. When John first called them, they asked him for an address. He wasn't exactly sure what to say. But he did tell them one Cessna Boulevard. As soon as they heard one Cessna Boulevard, they were on their way. And they actually came down one Cessna Boulevard, turned right on the runway, and went down the runway. But at least they were here. We got them here. Um, there are three locations of uh, defibrillators, two at the Country Club, one at the Downwind Restaurant, one in Keith Phillips Hangar. So if you're out there someday and somebody's riding a bicycle, has a problem, we do have some emergency equipment. So please know where it is. Know the address that you need to dispatch to. If you can't remember these addresses, the downwind is 100 Cessna Boulevard. 100 Cessna Boulevard will get the fire trucks in the location of the downwind. Going back to our, oh, by the way, that's my phone alarming. That was 11 and a half minutes. From the time I started talking until you just heard that alarm on my phone, that was 11 and a half minutes. That's how long it was from the time the phone call was made to 911 till the first fire truck entered the runway at the intersection of Cessna Boulevard. Once John said I got the fire truck in sight, 911 dropped off the line. Look at Chad and Lori's golf cart. On the back of their golf cart, they have a fire extinguisher, a very large fire extinguisher. They also have an ax. On that ax is a piece of steel about the size of a pencil, very pointed, very strong. That would break a canopy. More and more people now have fire extinguishers and equipment like this on their golf carts. So we are the first responders. There's no doubt about it that the people around an airport, we are the first responders. And again, for our friends from Massey, do you have equipment like this? Do you know where it is? Do you? <laughs> you caught me off guard. Do you know where the equipment is? Do you know what address? Give 911. Same thing with you folks who fly out of the land. What would you tell 911 if you needed to dispatch a fire truck or rescue equipment to someplace on a Deland airport? So it's real important that you know an address. Uh, Rick and I kind of uh, worked in cahoots on this. It's called Training While Waiting. It's on our website now. It's an idea that we kind of came up with. And by what we mean is, what are we doing right now? We can't fly to lunch. We can't go to Williston. We can't go to Flagler, Umatilla. We go fly a little bit, and we come back. What a great time to do a little training. This is uh, an airplane questionnaire that I actually plagiarized from the Civil Air Patrol. I, I'm an I'm a instructor and check pilot in the Civil Air Patrol. Every year we have to take a check ride. And every year we do an airplane questionnaire. Take a look at this. Download this on your spare time. Fill it out. It's an open book test. Fill it out on your airplane. When I do a, uh, 
a BFR. I use this advisory circle that the FAA puts out. And again, this is stressing the word regulatory review. This is a review. It's not a test. It's not a, oh my goodness, how stupid are you? This is a good review of things that we should be doing on a yearly or biennial basis to help us become safer and more current pilots. All the references are there. Now you probably don't drive around with one of these in your golf cart, but you don't have to. All the references are on there, the FARs, the maneuvers, you can just look them up, you can go on the Google, Google the FARs if you want. Uh, a sample question, a sample question that comes up and I'm just going to leave it open to you. If you fly, when you fly out of your home airport and you don't go more than 50 miles from your home airport, do you need an ELT? Can you answer that question? Probably not, but the answer is it depends. So that is one of the uh, questions on here about ELTs. This is just a review. Um, here's the uh, flight procedures that I usually use or suggested to use. Go up, do some slow flight, maybe some steep turns. When's the last time you actually stalled your airplane intentionally? So let's start thinking safety. We've got this time. Go up, take your airplane up, have some fun with it. Lots of times I'll uh, pull the power back on downwind and try to put it on the second stripe or the third stripe. A little practice, it's just a review. This material is available to download on our website. Love to see you download it and practice some of the uh, maneuvers within it. Another great resource we have is the simulator. That's not it, but Jack Murray's done a great job with our simulator. Um, we had a little issue with the heading bug. He corrected that, it's working great. This simulator, you can go shoot approaches anywhere in the United States. Florida's pretty flat. Take the sim, take the sim with an instructor, head up to uh, Rutland, Vermont, or Lebanon, New Hampshire. Shoot an approach into Rutland, Vermont. See what that's like. You can do it with Jack in the simulator or some of the other instructors that are checked out in it. It's, it, it's a great resource. Everybody loves Vermont. You go to Vermont all the time. See, he's heckling me now. So. Anyway, again, uh, back to the website. This is under the tab of chapter activities, training while waiting. So uh, thank you, Rick, for putting all that stuff on the website. Hopefully people will find it interesting and useful. That's Matt's number. Any more heckle calls, Matt? No more heckling? Uh, uh, we had about three people come up with a good idea to put the, the addresses on the firebox. We should put the addresses right on the firebox. Yeah. Yeah, Two Beach Boulevard. Remember Two Beach Boulevard. If, if nothing else, come to Beach Boulevard. Come to Beach Boulevard. I want you to beach, come to Beach Boulevard. So that's an easy one to remember. But I'll, I'll pass along any suggestions to Jim Stone and Jeff Rule, the airport manager and assistant. And by the way, they inspect those boxes on a monthly basis to make sure all the equipment is there, the pressures are good in the uh, fire extinguishers. So I, I'll pass that um, request along. That's Matt's number again. Our chapter uh, is doing another race scholarship for this year. It's a little bit different. Um, last year, headquarters provided a full $10,000 scholarship. This year, we, the chapter matches it. Headquarters provides $5,000. We provide another $5,000. Uh, for anybody who wants to get a private pilot certificate, if there's any money left over, you can use it on uh, instrument rating, commercial rating. Applicants should be filling out the application, and the applications are being accepted from now to the end of April. There'll be a selection committee in May. Here's some of the requirements. You gotta be 15 for a glider, 16 for a powered airplane, can't be over 19 when you get your license. So this is, again, this is all on the website. Anybody who's interested or has a candidate, submit it to, please to Craig Cousins. Craig is our race scholarship uh, coordinator. There's his uh, email address. All of this, again, is on our website. After the award, there's a few requirements. Back to the website, uh, almost every day I look at it and Rick's got something new on there. Very, very interesting stuff on there. So let's get to the, uh, the virtual tour as we called it. Um, it. It was pretty tough to find a, a guest speaker tonight that would come and talk to 100 people with the virus going around. So we kind of decided, um, why don't we let you guys talk? So 
we're going to do a little virtual tour. I asked people to submit pictures and, and write-ups about their airplanes or their project. Actually, a really good response, but it was interesting, the write-ups. Some people put in two words. Some people put in essays. So it's really uh, uh, obvious that we love our airplanes. Hold on for one second. I just need a drink of water here. Straight gin, can't you tell? Vodka, Russian vodka. So one of the things I was surprised at, and I, I don't know why, if you don't have a hangar but you want to build an airplane, where does it start? Most people, it starts in the garage. So my question is, for you guys that are building projects, what's in your garage? And I think I found the answer. Yeah, it's your wallet. You've pretty much left your wallet in your garage to begin your project. So before I get started on the tour, you know, I'm from Maine, so I need things explained to me a little bit. There's a few words that I need to define, and the lingo of a garage is almost, nearly, mostly, just about, soon, or 90%. And all those words mean, it, won't, it ain't done yet, but it's a work in progress. So as we take these tours, keep those words in mind. Understand that it ain't done yet, but it's in progress. So the first one out of the box is Bill Merkins. Now, Bill Merkins is one of the guys that send two words. New paint job on my RV6. Is that three words? Yeah, he was one of the ones that uh, really, really easy to edit that one. So it looks good with the checkerboard design. Uh, great looking airplane. No, notice that uh, that's the only airplane I've ever seen with a wheel pan on the tail wheel. So that's Bill Merkin's airplane. I said in my email, if it's flyable, send in some information about it. Joe Friend builds these one six scale models. This is a one six scale model of a Newport 17. One six scale model of a Sopwith Pup. And Joe's comments are, you can't ride in them, but they're a fun challenge to build and fly. So we love our airplanes. Chuck Eastlake. His RV-12, hanging it at the land. Chuck spent three years building it at home in Port Orange in his garage. He then trailed it to the land. And what Chuck loves about the airplane is it is trailerable. It's got the sailplane style, quick disconnect wings. His first flight was September 2016. He's now flown at about 255 hours. And he makes a comment, as I hear is true, of all RVs, it's well behaved. And I think Chuck means by that it's a nice flying machine. It's fun to fly. It's very forgiving. It doesn't have any, any bad, bad traits. So that's Chuck's airplane. And again, it started in his garage. Matt's phone number. Please include your name in the message. This is from John Poe. Now, you're all going to ask me, who the heck is John Poe? I'll get to that. John says he's been building a WaveX for the past three and a half years and just about to find someone to inspect it. Notice that just about. It's a Model A WaveX powered by a Volkswagen Aero V, 80 horsepower with a Prince P prop and Dynon Skyview HDX avionics package. John says, I'd be more than happy to have a few people at a time stop by to look. I'm at 2084 Country Club Drive or Taxiway Tango. I told you I was going to tell you who John Poe is. Well, John Poe is the newest member of Chapter 288. He's also probably one of the newest residents of Spruce Creek. I hate to do this to you, John, but you're going to hear it more than once. John Poe now owns Ron Vickery's house. So now you know where to go find John in his Wavex. He'd love to have you stop by and take a look at it. John's also a retired airline, American Airlines pilot. He flew A4s in the Marines. So welcome to the chapter, John. Maybe someday we'll get to meet you face to face. Here's Tom Cody. Tom Cody just completed an airplane I had never heard of, a Sport Performance Aircraft Panther. Apparently, this airplane has its designs or its origins up near the Jacksonville, Florida area. I had actually never heard of a SPA Panther. They brought one here? Well, I guess I must have missed that. Yeah. Matt says he loves that airplane. They, they actually brought one down here. So this is Tom's. He started his Panther in late November of 2018 built this Panther in his garage in Port Orange, moved it to the Deland Airport this past January, had the airworthiness inspection March 4th, and his first flight was on 
Friday, the 13th of March. So just about a month ago, congratulations, Tom. Um, and uh, really, really glad to see you had your first flight. A little more details. It has a 3.3 Corvair engine, ground adjustable sensing. It's prop, Dynon Avion Avionics. Interesting that Tom wrapped the entire aircraft using 3M2080 vinyl. He said, I've never worked with vinyl before, and it was a fun experience. I um, have to ask him, how much fun was it? And the build time was slightly more than 1,300 hours. Hey, we have a question. Yeah, Joe, if you're watching, uh, we have a question. Where do you fly your RC airplane? Probably over on uh, Tomoka Farms Road. There's a big uh, RC club over there. But Joe Friend, if you get in touch with Scott, Scott, get in touch with Joe. Uh, there is an RC club over on Tomoka Farms Road, just, just north of uh, Pioneer, north of uh, Taylor. Speaking of Scott and Lynn, how about that, huh? Good timing. Um, here they are. They're enjoying the delivery process of the, uh, at Cirrus. This is their current airplane, which is their 10th airplane. It's a 2014 Cirrus SR-22. They took delivery in 2017. It's the fourth Cirrus that Scott and Lynn have uh, owned. If you haven't been to a delivery, which I've not, of a Cirrus, it looks like they roll out the red carpet. They really know how to do the delivery process. Very interesting footnote on this. If you notice the tail number of the airplane in the picture, the tail number of their airplane has been changed to 892 Charlie Mike. The reason for the tail number change, in 1989, Scott and Lynn were married. So in 1989, two people married, and they had two children, Cole and Morgan. So there you go, 892 Charlie Mike. It just goes to show you how much these airplanes become part of our family and how much we enjoy having them around us. Incidentally, Cole, their son, sold it on his 16th birthday got his private on the 17th. So again, it's, it's this aviation business, we're, we're a big family. We invite everything, even our, we even name our airplanes. So this is a great tail number story. So thank you both for submitting that. Shirley Skog and Phil Risley, they're from Deltona. That's a Rans 19 that they built about three years ago. But they weren't satisfied with that. So now they're building a not quick build kit, an RV9A quick, uh, RV9A project, not a quick build. Where are they doing it? At their house in the land, in their workshop, in the garage. So eventually as the pieces get bigger, they move them to the land. The engine is an IO360, cold intake. It's got 188 horsepower. Avionics, a Dynon Skyview has been wired. They're currently finishing the engine, the cockpit controls. They need to install a canopy and engine, which are both major tasks. And that's why these projects are 90% done, 90% to go. Keith Phillips Cougar, interesting story. This airplane, if my memory serves me, now Keith, Keith is the one who wrote the essay. Uh, there's a lot to be said about this airplane. Built from plans, paid $6.35 for the plans several years ago. So here's a brief history. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll just leave it up there for a little bit and let you all read it. And if you have any questions, well, everybody knows where to find Keith. But this airplane, again, ended up in a garage, stayed there for years, and now Keith and Hugh are rebuilding it. So there's a bit of the history. Uh, my clicker's not working. There it goes. Uh, throughout this, Keith became good friends with Steve Whitman. And if you don't recognize that name or if it sounds kind of familiar, Think of the airport in Oshkosh, was named after Steve Whitman. So since uh, he moved it to uh, Virginia, brought it home in the garage, it's been in storage in several places. He had good intentions in rebuilding it, but the SX-300 and the Pitts Model 12 got in the way. Hugh Waller, one of our chapter snowbirds, commented that next winter we will get started on the Cougar. So they've actually been moving forward on it now. The difference between a Cougar and a Tailwind uh, you can read that. Steve Whitman designed the Tailwind. Someone else kind of stole his design, called it a Cougar. But the big difference when Keith was looking for an airplane to build, plans for the Tailwind, $125. Plans for a Cougar, $6.35. So as he says, being a young lieutenant, he immediately bought a set of Cougar plants for 6 bucks. started building it. 
And it wasn't until he tried to buy the engine mount from Steve Whitman that he realized that the person who took over the plants changed it quite a bit. So anyway, he, when, he re when this person redesigned the plants, all he did was he charged for the printing. That's why it was $6.35. So as a result, Keith's airplane is more of a tailwind than it is a Cougar, but he kept the Cougar name. He didn't bother to change the name since it started out as a Cougar. There it is today. Hugh and Keith are working on uh, re restoring it. It's, uh, it's, a good pro it's a big project to see, but I think, again, we'll see it flying. This is a picture of it again in flight, and this picture was taken early flight testing. As you can see, there's a lot of tufting on it, and it looks like it's a pretty, pretty streamlined airflow going through there. But uh, Keith built that from a set of plans. No quick build on that one. Ted Chang. Ted's in the hangar across from me. Every time I go to my hangar, Ted's in his hangar working on his new RV-10. He has worked on that airplane almost every day. He's really an inspiration as to just, if you put in enough time, how fast can you really do something like this? Come on, it won't click. There it goes. Just the other day, he brought it outside, fired up the avionics, the GPS is working. As you can see, it's almost done. But the amazing thing is, he started on the airplane, let's call it March 1st, 2019. Here we are in the middle of April. So just slightly over a year ago, he started on the airplane. And look at how much he's done. Really made a lot of progress on that airplane. So congratulations to Ted. Um, he, he's got a little bit of a write-up in here. and It's interesting that uh, the word is mostly, and again, mostly done. However, I have to stress the word mostly. And most likely, he plans to fly it sometime this summer. So that's great. I hope we're all around to watch his first flight. Next slide. Okay, there we go. Okay, here's another, another quiz for you. If you were totally restoring a T-34 and you're going to have it painted, stripped and painted, how many parts can be removed from a T-34? You can see on the table in front of you the elevators and the rudder and ailerons and whatnot, but there's a table back here with a whole bunch of parts on it. So if you're going to repaint a T-34, that's what you're going to be doing. Anyway, this is Greg Ryan's airplane. Um, he's totally restored the inside of it. It's in the final stages at the 90% stage of painting. And uh, like most T-34s, this one started out as an Air Force trainer. It had a stint with the New Mexico Civil Air Patrol. So Greg has decided to paint it and preserve both uh, the heritage of the Air Force and the New Mexico cap. Uh, can't wait to see that airplane on the field. It's going to be a beautiful design. Oh, and by the way, if you took all those parts off a of T-34 to paint them, how many parts would you have to put back on? And the answer is 88. So there's 88 parts on those tables that Greg has taken off, prepped, and will be putting back on his airplane at some point. This is an interesting uh, garage project, Craig Cousins. Um, I think right now the airplane has got so much stuff on it that the golf cart won't even fit in the garage. But again, Craig's been looking for his wallet in the garage, can't really find it. Seems like he ran out of room in his garage, so it's now a living room project. So there it is in the living room with some parts in the back of the picture there, and I thought, my goodness, Craig, how's your wife feel about having an airplane in the house? And fortunately for Craig, she's all for it. She's happy to help. Um, there she is in the back of the airplane with a bucking bar, hearing protection, helping out to build this airplane. So again, airplanes can be a real family endeavor, a real family affair. Speaking of a family affair, his dog Curly, and he's got his two and a half year old grandson helping him push the airplane back in the hangar. So Bob built that R4, uh, RV-14A. Uh, he's got a lot of help there from his grandson. That's the inside of it. And he has a few comments about the airplane. Uh, most of you know that Bob built an RV-7 prior to this. And he feels uh, the 14, well, first of all, the, the RV-14 was first flight in February of 2019. It's got an IFR panel, uh, Dyno Autopilot, G5 backup. The paint is base coat, clear coat with Ford colors. 
It's a great flying airplane, 175 knots at altitude. And what he, what he likes about it and what sounds good to me is a lot more room than the IV-7. Several inches wider, good for me. 200 pounds more useful load, really good for me. More fuel. And he says this about it. The kit was a pleasure to build. So, Craig, I hope you're listening to this. It was a pleasure to build many advances in streamlining of the kit compared to the IV-7. It has follow flaps as well as reflex, reflex flaps. He has an IO-390 in it. So uh, thank you, Bob, for submitting that one. Probably one of the most unusual projects that, I, that was submitted was uh, Chris Martin is building a Europa XS monowheel. Yeah, it's got one wheel under the middle, a couple outriggers, and that's what, uh, that's what it looks like when it's done. Again, he, he wrote quite a bit about it, but basically it's a design from England. It's quite popular in the 2000s. It's intended to be an airplane that can be flown from grass runways, then taken apart, stored in a trailer, taken home, put it in the garage. Because keeping an airplane in airports in England is apparently very expensive. So you go to the airport, fly your airplane, put it on a trailer, bring it home, put it in the garage. Um, it's designed for a Rotax 912. It'll do 120 to 130 knots with 80 horsepower. With the turbo engine, it'll cruise at 170 at 10,000 feet. Thanks to the large flaps, it stalls at 40. Home-built airplanes in England must go through an entire certification process. I did not know that. The Europa was even certified for aerobatics. Over 700 were completed and flown in over three, 33 countries. And he says, okay, I know, not as many as the vans. But it is a simply a cool and different airplane. It should be fun and economical airplane to build and operate. I, I like what Chris said about building airplanes. He got this Europa monowheel kit. It was, it was uh, given, he got it from a, a chapter uh, up in Atlanta. The kit was donated to the chapter. Chris bought it quite inexpensively. His intent with this kit was to have fun building an airplane but not spend much money. And that really is what EAA is all about. And, then, and he says, in his opinion, that's what the whole home built movement was about when EAA was originally created. In all, I have around 20,000 in this plane. That includes engine and instruments. But of course, he has a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in it also. And he realizes that if you're not dead set on having fancy new avionics, there's enough used avionics for sale for inexpensive money here in Spruce Creek. So this is really, in my opinion, um, oh, there's, there's the, uh, the day he put the cowling on it. And the spider is because he took this picture on Halloween. So he added that spider to the cowling. But really, um, the spirit of EAA is to fly, have fun, build your airplane, do it inexpensively, have friends, do some social activities, and just have fun flying. So I think Chris kind of epitomizes the idea of building an airplane, $20,000. $20,000 for the airplane, build it himself, and he'll have fun flying it. And it should be a really unique airplane that we see flying around uh, Central Florida. Call your attention to the EAA Builder's Log, which is available if you're building an airplane and you want to document it. If you want to share your experiences, you can upload your photos, upload things that are going on with it. It's a good place to document it. I believe the files are backed up once a week. The pictures that, uh, of Craig's airplane, came from his builder's log. I asked for a few pictures, he just pointed me towards his builder's log. So it's a very good place, it's free. Um, it's on the EAA national website. A new feature the EAA is doing starting tonight, um, actually it started last week, on Thursdays at uh, eight o'clock Eastern time, they have free webinars dedicated to home building. Tonight's topic is choosing wheels and brakes as you can read on the screen. The next couple of weeks, they have different topics. I'm really looking forward to the one on April 30th because Charlie Becker, if anybody can do it, Charlie Becker can take a four-year project and talk about it and describe it in a one-hour webinar. So that would be what's involved in kit building. Charlie's going to break that all down to a one-hour. I thought you were going to say Charlie could take a four-year project and turn it into a 12-year project. Charlie could take a four-year project and make it a 12-year project. Charlie, are you listening? I hope not. <laughs> I think it's going to be... A, uh, it's interesting. In the average of four years to build an airplane, Charlie's going to do it, show us how to do it in one hour. So I know he can do it. I know he can do it. So I want to say um, uh, thanks. To, oh, wait a minute. I forgot about the 50-50 drawing. The 50-50 drawing. We, yeah, of course, we always have one. We had, we had a benefactor tonight 
who dropped off a thousand dollars. So there's a thousand dollars in the kitty. So whoever wins tonight is going to split that one thousand dollars. So go get your tickets. Just kidding. You don't have any tickets. There's only three tickets in here. Woo! So our odds are pretty good. Pretty good for the 50-50. It's either going to be Dave, Matt, or yours truly. Oh, let's put, <laughs> let's put a ticket in. Yeah. Hey, hey Dave, can I ask you if right now it's just uh, we're basically in your hangar. You've seen what other people have in their hangars in their garage. Would you mind just showing us what's in your hangar? Talk a little bit about your Waco or whatever. Here, give you the mic. Dave. Hi. <clears throat> well, you got the camera, Matt? The, well, go ahead. This is a Waco UPF-7. It's going to be 80 years old on August 3rd. And um, I've had it for about 13, 14 years. I flew it up to Seattle and all around the country. It's been up in Maine. It's done the four corners. Um, not Alaska, but uh, everything else. And I've given probably over a thousand rides in it. It's just been, it's been really fun. Uh, brought a lot of pleasure to some, some excited people uh, to get to fly in an open cockpit biplane. This plane over here is a, an extra 300L. Um, I purchased it a few years ago and have done some work to it. And um, it's a, a standard certified aircraft. It was owned by Wayne Handley. That's uh, where the tail number came from. Um, the plane behind it is an SX-300, um, which we're all familiar with here at Spruce Creek. Um, it's a 250, 55 knot airplane at eight, 10,000 feet. And, um, and it's really fun to fly as well. And then that's the hangar. There you go. Thanks, Dave, for the tour of your hangar and these great, great aircraft back here. So aviation is spoken here. We all love it. Um, so thanks to Matt for making this possible. It was his idea and his techie, uh, all this equipment that I'm looking at here that's making this uh, possible. I want to say thanks to uh, Super Dave and Stu uh, for having us uh, share a laugh with us during these not-so-funny times. And uh, when you're done, uh, just please up, stack the chairs. Oh, wait a minute. Don't pick up your furniture. I'm just kidding. No, no chairs to stack. No, thank you. No chairs to stack. So um, the bar is open, but not at Dave's hangar. Uh, <laughs> anyway, thanks for watching. That's about it. You have time now to go uh, log into that uh, webinar that's going to be uh, presented tonight by National EA headquarters. Okay, Matt, Matt just said he will send an email to everyone with the address so that this can be rewatched if you want to see me a second time. Charlie Becker says he heard my comment and thanks for the plug. All right. Hey, everybody, fly safe. Look out for one another. Stay a six-foot distance, and hopefully, hopefully in a really short time, we'll be back doing our regular flying, regular socializing. We need to socialize. Love you all. Thanks for watching. Cut, Matt. Cut.